chapter 150. It says, Praise the Lord. <laughs> we're doing a series on praise. This series is called Holy Roar. This morning, we're going to focus on that word praise. You might say, well, there's a lot of praise in the Bible. There's a lot of things that say praise. But how many know there's like seven different Hebrew words in the Old Testament that mean praise? And so the first Hebrew word that we're going to go over this morning is the word halal. It's where we get our word hallelujah. Y'all ever said hallelujah, all you church folk? Well, yeah, hallelujah. You know, maybe you're, maybe you're Medea and you have an R on the end of it. <laughs> hallelujah, you know. Uh, he says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and with the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and with the dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and with flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. How many of y'all got breath in your lungs this morning? Come on, you're going to love this praise. You might say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not that guy that does the, the external kind of worship. I'm just worshiping right here in my heart. Well, this kind of praise you're not going to like then. Because this kind of praise is a very external type of praise. It comes from the Hebrew word number 1984. For those of you who are studying Hebrew, halal. Its definition is to shine to flash forth light, to praise, to boast, to be boastful, to be praised, to be praised worthy, to be commended, to be worthy of praise, to boast, to glory, to make one's boast, or to make a fool of, to make into a fool, to act madly, or to act like a madman. <laughs> now, halal, this word halal, is the primary word used for praise in the Old Testament. And so it is the word by which we de derive that word hallelujah. So when you're just saying hallelujah, what you're saying is I'm bragging and I'm boasting about the God that I serve. Come on, it's not just, oh yeah, I agree with that, hallelujah, praise God. No, when you say hallelujah, there is a bragging and a boasting about who God is and what he's done in your life. So this word halal, it is an exuberant expression of celebration. A word that connotes boasting, raving, or celebrating. It carries with it the notion of acting in a way that is clamorously foolish. <laughs> I don't think we've hit clamorously foolish just yet. Come on, on the scale of uh, here's internal praise and here's clamorously foolish, we're probably about like a two. Come on, we try to keep it very safe. Well, I don't want anybody thinking I'm crazy around here. Come on, these people already think you're crazy anyway. <laughs> Go ahead and turn it up a notch. Come on. You might as well be what they think that you are. <laughs> True halal contemplates laying aside your inhibitions and killing your self-consciousness. So you stop thinking about what am I looking like when I do this and you just start thinking about I'm just here to glorify and magnify God. Really in this word halal, there's a lot about dancing. Now some of y'all been in the club, you know how to dance. Come on. I, I, I used to love it in Santa Paula. You know we had a lot of club people come into our church. I'm not talking about cavemen. You know I'm talking about people that <laughs> frequent the club. <laughs> And they dressed like they were in the club. And they looked like they were in the club. And then, Lord, my goodness, when the Lord fell in the house, I mean, they danced like they were in the club. My goodness. Children, hide your eyes, you know. Uh, how many of you, they didn't know what they were doing. But it wasn't about what they were doing. It wasn't about who they were. They're like, man, this is the only expression that I know how to let this thing out. I'm going to dance the way that I know how to dance. <laughs> Come on, get down with your bad self. If you go back one chapter to Psalms chapter 149, it says in verse 1, he says, praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and praise in the assembly of his saints. Come on, you can do this while you're at church. You remember last, last week we talked about there's some assembly that's required. Come on, nobody wants to get a, a bicycle in a box for Christmas. 
They want it assembled. But a lot of the body of Christ is just sitting around like a bunch of boxed bicycles. Come on, but when you, when you come around an assembly like this, there's a lot of people that have some wrenches. Come on, they can tighten you up in some places. They can get you going straight. If you're out of alignment, they can get you into alignment. And the way the body of Christ does that doesn't do it by whipping people. It does it by love. Come on, somebody. That's the way we do it. In verse 2, he says, Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and with the harp. Can you imagine the Hebrew people gathered together here? There's tens of thousands of Levites. And the musicians face the Israelites. And together they form sort of a praise pit. Now when I was growing up, you know, we used to go to all different kinds of concerts uh, around here. And they were terrible concerts. I was in some of those bands. That was just absolutely terrible. And every once in a while, you know, this is when the grunge and the, uh, you know, the not really goth. I was never into the goth thing. But, you know, there was some of my friends that were into that. And, you know, some of these bands, you couldn't hear anything that they were playing. It was just kind of like your beast thing, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, Elijah used to be in a Christian rock band that uh, he just used to scream. The Lord's delivered him. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. Uh but, you know, we would be in these, in these atmospheres. One of the places that we used to have these shows is called Redmond's Hall out in Johnstown. And this hall uh, was pretty interesting because it was the grungiest thing you've ever walked into. Don't sit on the toilet because you probably catch something. You know, that kind of place. And so, you know, this band is just playing. I don't think they could hear each other. Anytime I was in one of those bands, it wasn't real fancy. We're like we had in-ear monitors and we could hear exactly what we're doing. We're just like, like a bunch of gorillas on the stage, you know. It was awful. Like we almost took out Chuck E. Cheese's band, you know, because we were, we were just like them. <laughs> Our eyes didn't go back and forth as much in that weird manner. But, you know, every once in a while there was this pit that was formed in the middle. And they called it a mosh pit. How many of y'all ever been in a mosh pit before? All right. See, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Come on, what do you tell somebody who's got two black eyes? Nothing. You already told them twice, right? So you're in this mosh pit, right? And people have their elbows up, and they're spinning around, and they're clocking people. And it was just awful. I'm like, I don't want to be in that. <laughs> like, that's why I started playing, like, John Mayer type music. Like, your body is wonderland. You know, I was like, you ain't going to boss to that in my show. But can you imagine what was going on there? Come on, as the praisers were going out and they started to form this pit of praise. <laughs> there was a combustible energy. And y'all that have been in these mosh pits, you can understand the combustible energy. Sometimes the mosh pit will get closer and closer. You get beat up, man. You get punched in the face. You get elbows to the neck. You know, all these things. But that's not the way that I believe it was here. <laughs> it's kind of a good picture, though, you know. But here they are. Just in that moment, the worshipers would begin to shout. Come on, they would begin to laugh. They'd begin to dance, and they jumped around. They had their hands up raised. Come on, there was an expression of worship. There was an expression of praise. And so to the outward observer now, they might have appeared like they were drunk or they were foolish. Come on, a lot of people in the body of Christ, even today, if somebody just went nuts and started running around the church, elbows up, side to side, come on, leaning like a cholo. I'm in the wrong crowd. Where are all my Mexicans at, you know? Uh, come on, I used to pastor Mexican people. I love the Mexican people. They would jam out to this song, elbows up, side to side, lean like a cholo. You don't think it's a real song? Look it up. <laughs> Kid wrote it like 20 miles away from where our church was in, in California. And so, uh, you know, I just, I, I used to play that. And I'm as white as white. I'm like Casper the Clown, you know, whatever, Casper the Ghost, you know. I'm just riding around, <laughs> pumping out this music. But, you know, uh, there was an outward expression of their praise. 
And so to some people, they might have appeared that they were drunk or they were foolish. But let me tell you, they were most sober in their celebration of God. Come on, they realized what God has done in their life. There was a time that they realized, listen, me just singing a song is not enough anymore. Me just kind of giving a nice courtesy clap during a fast song is not good anymore. Come on, me just, well, you know, lifting the TV. You know, you've seen that video where it shows all different kinds of hand raises. Me lifting the TV is just not good anymore. Come on, there's a place that you hit in the spirit when you start to praise him. I remember there was a, there was a time that uh, I had first moved out to California. I had gotten on the worship team out there. And uh, the pastor, Pastor Ray, said, hey, we're going to go to Palm Springs. And we're going to go for a Sunday evening service. And uh, we're, I need you guys to sing and back me up. And so I, you, you were there, right? And so uh, this is before we were even dating, I think, right? And so uh, here I was, you know, this big stage in this, in this church, probably three times as wide as this, you know, same, same depth, just about, about seats 500 people. And so my pastor, Pastor Ray, for those of you who don't know who he is, he's like a crazy gospel singer. Crazy. Like, like he was born the wrong color almost kind of gospel singer. And so he's singing out there, and he's singing this song called Turn Around. Now, I, I, I just said, man, I've seen crazy services where people will dance. People will shout, and people act like a fool, but that's not me. You know, I'm the kind of guy that sings the Chris Tomlin song, you know, with the guitar, and this is about as, I mean, even this is too much, you know. Uh, how great, you know, and I'm just, no, I'm not, there's nothing against that. That's who I was. And so all of a sudden in this moment, the spirit just fell in this house, in this room, you know, in the church. And he's singing this song about turn around. I forget the words exactly. But it comes up to a bridge, and it, it kind of says, what the devil meant for evil, God's going to turn it for good. I said, my God's going to turn it around. And, you know, he's doing his gospel thing, you know, and just, nah, you know, and I'm just, all of a sudden I noticed that my feet were moving so fast. I could not keep up with it. I'm a large man. Large men's feet should not move that fast. It's like trying to jump on a treadmill doing 10 and you're just standing on the sides. Come on, don't do it. It'll throw you into a wall. <laughs> but there, I'm just like, whoa. I started having my own little mosh pit back there. I got done after that, and I just said, my gosh, I have never moved like that in my life. It was a halal kind of praise. Come on, it was something that you just don't just get into and say, well, I'll see what happens. Uh, I'm just going to kind of do this thing and see what happens. You know, it's, it was like, man, God just kind of put his hand on me. I was like, dance. You know? It was probably more graceful than that. <laughs> you all remember the, 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 the uh, cartoons with Yosemite Sam when he would just shoot at the ground and make people dance. Like that's what I felt like was going on. And I started twirling and dancing about. I've never had any formal dance training in my life. But I'll tell you what, the Lord put it on me that day. But in that praise, something was broken off of me. Come on, there's a lot of times that we're praying, God, break this thing off of me. Get this thing. I don't want to put up with this thing anymore. I don't want to put up with this habit anymore. I don't want to put up with this way of life anymore. But we're never doing anything to get out of that place. Come on, Albert Einstein said this. If you just keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, you're dumb. You know, right? That's insanity. Maybe you're not dumb, but insanity and dumb are pretty close, right? And so uh, if you want something to change in your life, how many know you need to change something? Go over to uh, 2 Samuel in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 6. You all doing all right? Good. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 11. Now here, uh, if you preface this, we go back to verse 1, and I'm not going to just for sake of time, but... Uh, 
da uh, David was trying to get the Ark of the Covenant back to the city of David, back to Israel. And uh, he went and he tried to do it one way and it didn't work. Somebody touched the Ark of the Covenant and dropped dead right on the spot. Now in the Old Testament, you know, the Ark of the Covenant was symbolized by the presence of God or God in, in the flesh, really. And so they carried him in this ark about, and anywhere that the ark was, there was the presence of God. And so if anybody were to touch it unrighteously, they would fall and drop dead. And so they would carry it on poles or, 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 or on a certain way with certain priests that would carry this. And so it got to the place where this guy dropped dead, and, and Dave was like, man, we got to figure out a different way to do this. Because it's not working. And so they parked the, the ark over at the house of Obed-Edom. And that's where we'll pick up here in verse 11. It says, The ark remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. Now you stop right there and realize, man, when the presence of God is there, the blessing is there. Come on, some of you all are too scared to get in the presence of God. But really, when you get into the presence of God, that's where the blessing comes. And so the presence of God was there. Bless the house of Obed-Edom and his whole household. Now it was told to King, uh, King David saying, The Lord has blessed this house, Obed-Edom, and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. And so David went up and brought the ark of God to the house of Obed-Edom, to the city of, of David, with gladness. In verse 13 he says, So it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, they sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. And then David halaled or danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephah. And then David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came to the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, also David's wife looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling about before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And so they brought the ark of the Lord and they set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle of David that, had, that David had erected for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, and everyone, uh, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed and everyone to his house. And then David returned to bless his household. Isn't this interesting? He said, look what the Lord has done. He said, we tried to bring the presence of God into our city one way. It didn't work. But God inhabited the praises of his people. So every six steps or six paces. Hold on, gentlemen. I need to dance. <laughs> These guys probably looking at him the same way you just looked at me a moment ago. And you said, man, that's not a dance. That looks like he's having a seizure up here on the stage. <laughs> Come on, he, was, he danced before the Lord with all of his might, which means he wasn't thinking about it. Come on, he let his head go. He said, I'm not going to co concern myself with how I look. I'm not going to concern myself with whether I'm in step or not. I'm going to twirl. <laughs> Come on, the king was out there twirling before the presence of God. David sets such an example for the believers now in the New Testament to say quit thinking about what you're thinking about and just get your focus on him. Because when your focus is on God, you're just going to do whatever you feel like doing. Come on, you're going to praise him in whatever way you feel like praising him. Doesn't matter who's looking at you what way. Come on. Doesn't matter if, oh, well, I just, I'm really offended the way that they laughed at me. Who cares? Come on, if you want to be offended, you're going to get offended. If you're looking to be offended, you're going to be offended. But if you don't care what people think, I just had to get to the place where I don't care what people think anymore. Come on. Even Jesus said to the disciples, hey, if they don't receive you, just dust it off. Don't go on to the next house. There's some people that haven't received us, and you know what? At first... It was pretty tough. 
But then I just said, you know what? I'm going to get out the dust buster. So here David goes into his house. After McCall just says, well, listen, how glorious was it that the king of Israel today was uncovering himself in the eyes of the maids of his servants, and one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. And so David said to McCall, it was before the Lord. <laughs> oh, man. He's just getting to the point where he's about to say, woman, <laughs> it was before the Lord. And look how he says this, my gosh. He says, the Lord chose me instead of your dad. He appointed me over all the people of the Lord, over Israel, instead of your dad. He said, therefore, so I'm going to honor the Lord. I'm going to honor the Lord. I'm going to play music before the Lord. And he goes on to say, he goes, I'm going to be even more undignified than this. <laughs> he said, you thought that was something. You thought my little dance out there was something. You thought my little shuffle was something. You wait until you see the Spirit of God come on me again. I'm going to make you so embarrassed that you're never going to want to see me again. Well, and here this lady was really trying to hold him in a place of not praising God. You know what it says? She was unfruitful all the days of her life. She never had a child. And you might say, well, all these things that you've read today are all in the Old Testament, so I guess we don't have to do them anymore. I hope you're not saying that. But there's plenty of praise in the New Testament. Go over to Acts chapter 16. Let's read through this little story, and then we'll dismiss here in just a moment. Acts chapter 16. You know, Paul and Silas are just traveling through, doing what God has told them to do. Uh, they got the Macedonian call. They saw the vision of somebody over in Macedonia, and so they knew that they were to go that way. And so in verse 16, it happened as they went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of uh, divination met us and brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now I know that I've talked about this here before, but how many of you know, uh, uh, you know when you have a child, and that child even says something three times, it starts to get real annoying. <laughs> now, I saw something somewhere posted, maybe on Facebook or something, uh, around Mother's Day. And it says, you know, your, your child thinks that your name is not mom. It's mom, 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 mom. You know, Ruth would be upstairs and she'd be just like yelling. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, she won't hear this, hopefully. No, I love her. I don't care how many times she yells mom. I'll yell right back to her. What? <laughs> she goes. You're not mom. What? <laughs> so anytime, you know, somebody's just repeating something. And she wasn't saying this confirming really what was on them. She was saying this harassing them. These men are servants of the Most High God that proclaim to us the ways of salvation. Come on, one time is enough. But it says she did this for many days. Now, for what you don't know, Paul could have been a kung fu master and just chopped her head off. But he didn't. He said, I'm going to control this kung fu. <laughs> and what I am going to do, I'm going to turn to you greatly annoyed, and I'm going to tell you that that spirit needs to come out of you in the name of Jesus. It says that same very hour that spirit came out of that girl. And so the people were not very happy. Her masters, verse 19, said that were, uh, they saw that their hope of profit was gone, and they seized Paul and Silas and, uh, and dragged them in to the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach us customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or to observe. And then the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. 
Verse 23, it says, when they laid their hands on them, they uh, 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 laid the stripes on them. They threw them into the inner prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And so having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into stocks. Just for setting this girl free. Come on, just for going about the work of the ministry. But you know, the devil really likes to think that he's so smart in these times. Come on, the devil thinks that he has you when he throws you into your prison. I mean, you know, there's plenty of people right now that are in prison who aren't in prison. Come on, they're in bondage to things. They're bound to things. Come on, they might have addictions. They might have uh, 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 actual possession of the devil or things like that. And they're not behind bars necessarily, but in their life they can't flourish and do what God has called them to do because the devil has them bound. But you need to realize the devil, when he thinks that he's so smart, that when he'll throw you into jail, when he'll put you into stocks, when he's going to handcuff you, and he thinks he has you bound, one thing that he always forgets is he forgets to tape your mouth shut. Because this, this little thing underneath your nose, come on, it can either bless you or it can curse you. It can either set you free or keep you bound forever. It says that as we breathe uh, 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 his praise out, that God would inhabit the praises of his people. Say, I don't know why God never shows up at my house. Maybe because you're not praising him at your house. Come on, because as soon as you start praising him, God will just show up. I remember when I first realized this, that that, uh, I didn't have to necessarily be in church to experience the presence of God. Some people think, well, I just got to come to church because I really need a touch from God today. And you can really receive a touch from God when you're in the house of God. But God can touch you no matter where you're at. And so, I I mean, when I was working heating and air conditioning work, you know, I did that for 10 years. And uh, uh, before I hurt my back and I was just driving around, I would always have either teaching tapes or some kind of praise tape in, in, in my van. You might say, tapes? What are tapes? Well, kids, back in the day, I'm just kidding, uh, And so we used to listen to tapes. And I would just get that going into me and and feeding myself and and, and because I was just hungry for God. I said, I need more of this. One day a week is not enough. Two days a week is not enough. I need more. I need more. I need more. You know, the thing is, it says that the Lord will, will fill those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Come on, if you make yourself an open, willing vessel, God said, I'm going to fill that thing. And so as I started to just worship, I'd be, on, I'd be on work. I'd be driving. And I'd just be worshiping God right there in my car. Hand raised up even in my car. There'd be times where I looked like I was dancing. I might have been choking on something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But there's some, some songs that will just get to a place where you're just going to dance. You know, I say, ah, that's not me. I remember a lot of our, our, our family out in, in uh, California that were Mexican. These guys are gangsters, man. I, the real deal gangsters. Some of y'all think that you're gangsters here. You're not. Okay? Andrew, you're not a gangster. Uh, these guys, these are real gangsters. These are the kind of guys you don't want to, you know, meet in a dark alleyway at night. But how I many you know when they're walking next to you in the alley, all of a sudden you're like, ooh, I feel very safe. <laughs> I remember this one guy came in. He goes, yeah. He goes, just in case anything happens, Pastor, I got my shank right here. Well, bless the Lord. Praise God. <laughs> remember that? And so, I mean, and then he pulls it out. It's not, I mean, it's a this is like an inch short of a machete. I don't even know how he held this, you know, held this thing in there. I, I don't even know. It just popped out. He goes, whoosh. Well, glory to God. <laughs> Come on, this was before it was popular to pack. All, well, I don't know. It's always been popular there to pack, I suppose. But, uh, you know, other ones, they just said, you know, Pastor, we're going to protect you. I've got a pair of knuckles if anybody messes with you. Pastor Josh, if anybody gets on your on your nerves, you let me know. <laughs> I've got a specific set of skills. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they would always know who to call. 
<laughs> Come on. Sometimes in the early seasons of coming here, I wish I had my Mexican folk just to protect me. <laughs> but I got a whole bunch of people now that would protect me. And not only that, I've got God, my Father, that will protect me. But man, I'll tell you, <laughs> these guys were just gangsters. I don't know why I'm even talking about that. <laughs> what? Oh, they wanted praise. <laughs> we were talking about praise. But you know, their, their moms and their dads, some of them, you know, grew up with no dads. And so their mom said, listen, you got to be hard. You don't show anybody your emotions. Don't ever let loose. Don't ever cry. Don't ever do any of this. And so I remember Pastor Larissa has just got a real blessing to do this. She goes, now, uh, Manny, Manny is our associate pastor who is now the senior pastor at our city church in, in California. And she would bring him up. He was one of these guys. I mean, he had skulls tattooed all over his forearm. Come right now. It looks like, I mean, thicker than I am. This guy is huge, right? I mean, shorter than me, but twice as wide. And so, and had like a, just a huge head. Like you could really mess someone up. And Pastor Larissa would just say, you know, Manny, I know there's a real spirit of heaviness on you right now. And if you want that thing to come off, you really need to put on a garment of prayer. She goes, why don't you come on up here and dance before the Lord? <laughs> you know, kind of just, he would come up. <laughs> but you know what? It started out like that. And then after a while, he didn't care about who was looking, he didn't care about what anybody was thinking. He said, Listen, I'm not dancing before you. I'm dancing before the Lord. And the Lord promoted him into a place of leadership in that church to take over the church. A guy that was a gangster. And other guys that came in, tats just up their neck like spiders and things. And I look at him and I say, how are you going to get a job? <laughs> he goes, oh, I work at the tattoo place down the street. <laughs> Well, let's hope that doesn't close down, you know. <laughs> I mean, really, what, what I'm trying to get to you, when the devil thinks that he's given you his best shot, when he thinks that he's got you beat, when he's got you defeated, as soon as you start praising God, Come on, God shows up in that situation. He shows himself strong in that situation. And so after all these things happened to Paul and Silas, they were beaten with rods. They were stripped naked and shackled in there. It says, at the midnight hour in verse 25. At the midnight hour, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Come on, this was not a silent praise service. Well, let's have a moment of silence. Before our God. Oh, that was nice. <laughs> Conan said that they were singing out to God. And, and remember, they were fastened into the inner prison. So it wasn't a heavily populated part of the prison. And so they were singing, and it says that the prisoners could hear them. At that point in anybody's life, they could have looked at God and just shook a stick at him and said, man, how could you let this happen to me? All I'm doing is doing what you told me to do, and now I'm sitting in a place I can't see the light of day. I can't tell what time of day it is. I've got blood pouring out of me. I've got infections. I've got all this stuff going on. How many of you know they didn't say that? They got in there and started singing to God. They started praising God. Come on, some people probably, the ones that could hear them, said, aren't those guys just must be drunk on something? Why would they be singing unto a God who just got them beat and thrown into jail? 
But it says, as soon as they started singing, come on somebody, as soon as they started praising God, as soon as they started praying and lifting their voices unto God, it said there was an earthquake. It shook the whole prison where they were and everyone's chains were loose and every door was opened in the prison. <laughs> Do you know right now, there are people that are around you that are watching you to see what you do when all hell breaks loose on you. Come on, these guys were not participating in the praise, these other guys. It was just Paul and Silas having a church service in their little cell. But there's people on the outside of your cell today. On the outside of your situation, they're saying, well, I wonder what's going to happen. I saw what happened to their car. I saw what happened to their house. I saw that their kid isn't living for Jesus anymore. Oh, what's going to happen? What's their response going to be? See, the thing is, these spectators that are watching you, they don't realize that their victory is tied to you getting into a place of victory. Did you hear me? Their victory even though they're not praising, even though they're not shouting and they're not dancing, they're looking to you to say, listen, I believe that God's a true God. I believe that he's faithful to do what he said he'll do. I believe he'll set me free in the middle of bondage. I believe that I'll be healed in the worst kind of sickness. I believe that he'll supply all my need according to his riches and glory. And everybody is watching. And so when your victory comes through, they say, surely that is true. Surely their God has done that. Glory to God. And so this guy, he's like, man, I, I, he woke up out of a sleep. He was supposed to be keeping them securely. He saw all the doors were open. He was about to draw his sword and kill himself. The Apostle Paul said, don't do yourself any harm. He, he asked for a light. He come out. He said, Paul, Silas, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to experience this same power that has made everybody's chains fall off. The same power that made everybody's doors open up. What is this that I need to receive? And Paul and Silas said, you needed to just believe on the Lord Jesus and you're going to be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of God to him and all who were in his house. They took him that same hour of the night, washed his stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. And when they had brought him into the house, he set food before him and he rejoiced. Having believed with all of his household. A couple of closing points. Because Paul and Silas were in obedience and willing to worship in the darkest time, God didn't just show up in their lives, he also showed up in everybody in that prison's life. And it went beyond the walls of the prison into the jailer and his whole household. So there's two times, really, to praise. When you feel like it, and when you don't feel like it. Smith Wigglesworth said this, you know, it's a funny name, but the Lord, the, the Lord used him in mighty miracles to raise people from the dead and preach the word. He said, you must learn to take the victory and shout in the face of the devil, it is done. He also said, no man can doubt when he learns how to shout. <laughs> Here's what praise does. Praise emits life on the earth. Praise, uh, uh, when we praise as believers, it is, uh, uh, it is to be, uh, uh, our job as Christians, let me, let me just get this out. Our job as Christians is to be the body of Christ in this earth. And so when we praise, we are tapping into the springs of life. We're tapping into the rivers of life. We're tapping into living waters on the inside of us, and we are emitting that into the earth. Praise the Lord. Praise will obliterate fear and selfishness. Praise will cause our prayer life to be supercharged with God's presence and to be victorious and effectual. It aligns us with God's purposes so that we can walk out the possibilities he has for us. Praise is like twisting open a fire hydrant to your spirit and letting it out of your mouth. And say, well, I've never experienced that. Well, guess what? The more you do it, the more comes out. Come on, I encourage you to go from this place and be a praiser. Amen. Amen.